And since we've learned now how uh, IC work, uh, ICA works in principle, I want to talk to the cumulants, which are quite an interesting and more, more general uh, way of describing statistics of data. So let's start with moments. Moments are scalar numbers that uh, define uh, or describe the statistics of some multi possibly multivariate data. So they're ver defined in a very simple way. So the first moment is simply the average over a component. The second moment is the average over the product of two components. The third is the average over the product of three components. And the fourth moment is the product over four components, etc. Um, so these angular brackets here indicate the is an average process. So the component yi, so we have multiple data points with the component yi, and that is averaged over. So we sum over the data points m, the component i of the signal y. So y actually has two components. The one, the, super, the subscript is the component, and the superscript is the data point. And then we divide by m to take the average. So that's what we do if we calculate this, uh, this first order moment. Um, now, moments are used quite often as a description. And so collectively, they describe the statistics of some data. However, they have the disadvantage that higher order moments contain information that's already uh, can already be expected from low, lower order moments. That's shown here uh, in this example. So in this equation, we see we look at the second order moment of yi and yj. And it's quite obvious if it's not zero mean data that a large contribution to this term would be the product of the mean of yi and yj. And then there's something left over that is not described by simply taking the product of the means. And that's uh, sort of the, the interesting part. If you have zero mean data, uh, and we look at the fourth order cumulant, then uh, uh, then we see that we can expect pairwise sort of products of second order moments. So the cumulant of yi, yj, yk, yl can be expected to have contributions from yi, yj times yk, yl plus yi, yk times yj, yl, etc. So terms, I mean, there are a lot of more, lot more terms you could build with this for, fourth order uh, cumulants, such as um, y i y i y k y i j y k times y l for instance so these terms but um since we assume zero mean data, they all vanish, right? Okay, so for zero mean data, these are the ones that you would expect. These are all zero of this type. And then there's something left that is, that's only in the fourth order statistics and not in the lower order statistics. And it would be nice to just pick out that particular information. Um, yeah. So we know something like this already from second order, namely the variance. Yeah. So if you take the variance, we remove the mean. So the variance is a st um, second order cumulant 
auto cumulant because it's a cumulant in just one single variable in contrast to um, cross cumulant which would be um, a cumulant with two different components so for the variance we subtract off the mean in order to remove a contribution that we would expect already from lower order moments if you rewrite so this is a typical way one would uh, write the variance now in our context it's more more this uh, this formulation that would be more more appropriate so here we see we subtract off from the second order moment out of moment the product of the first order moments and that is a variance so that's the general idea of cumulants. So if you subtract from the moments, which are mathematically very sim simple, but conceptually somewhat complicated because the lower order contribution are mixed in. So if you subtract off from the, from the moments, contributions from the lower order moments, you end up having cumulants. Now for zero mean data, these are the first four cross cumulants. So the first cumulant is simply the mean, and since and that we set that to zero. The second order cumulant is simply the the moment, because there's nothing we can expect from lower order moments because the mean is zero. Likewise for third order. The terms that you could add here uh, um, would be of the sort of would be a second order moment times a first order moment. Yeah? So would be of so other potential components that you might have here would be of the form y i y j y k. But again, because of zero mean. This part would, would vanish, so again, we don't need to consider these terms. So, therefore, the fourth order cumulant is the first one that gets these additional terms subtracted off that we have uh, put up here as the part that can be expected already for the fourth order moment. And so, this is the fourth order cumulant. So these are cross cumulants, right? Cumulants with um, several components. Of course, you can define them also for in, for just one scalar variable. Then they would be called auto cumulants, or just yeah, also cumulants in one variable. Mm. We've seen this is the mean. This would be the variance. Um, the higher components, so the third order auto cumulant would be called skewness. And the fourth order autocumulant would be called kurtosis. So that's written here. So this would be the skewness, and this would be the kurtosis. Skewness. And these are often normalized such that they're independent of the scale of the variables, right? So if you divide C I I I I by CII squared, then if you scale the variable since both terms are to the power of 4 in a scaling factor, that would not matter. Now, but here in, 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 in this lecture, I will use them non, not normalized. Okay, so mean and variance is quite obvious what that means. So what is skewness and kurtosis? So that's illustrated in this figure here. So these are okay. Let's assume we have a Gaussian here. So what would change if we change the mean? Well, obviously the distribution would move to the left if the mean is uh, negative, and we would move to the right if the mean is positive. If this is a normalized Gaussian, it has a variance one. If the variance gets smaller, then the distribution gets narrower. If the variance is larger than one, then the variance, then the distribution gets wider. This is, should be known, I guess. 
skewness means how well in some sense how tilted it is maybe to one side or skewed it is to one side so even though so from a gaussian you can skew it so so towards this side yeah uh, so it has a heavy tail so a few large values on the left side and a lot of small values on the right side that that maintains zero mean but you see it's not a symmetric um distribution anymore so why is this so in that case this skewness is negative yeah so why is this negative i just said in order to maintain zero mean yeah you have to compensate sort of a, a few large negative values here with a lot of small values here now in the mean the values enter linearly so let's assume we have one data point here and we compensate that by okay so what would we need to compensate that maybe by four data points somewhere here yeah. so if you have st if you had started with a symmetric distribution like this one and we had four data points here and one data point there then the mean would be maintained right because the mean over these is again zero now if we call this so let's say this has a value of 4a and these have a value of a then the mean I mean, can, can calculate oh actually this has a value of minus 4a then the mean would be minus 4a for the left point for this point plus 4 times a for these four points and then the whole thing divided by 5 oops divided by five okay and that is zero because this already is zero okay so this is for calculating the mean so this for for the skewness we would take the third power of these so we would have minus 4a to the power of 3 plus 4 times a to the power of 3 divided by 5. Uh, so that would be the contribution um, of these 5 points to the skewness. It's quite obvious that I can take out the 4 So that would be minus 4 to the power of 3 times a to the power of 3 plus 4 times a to the power of 3 divided by 5. Oops, 5. So now you see. Um, that uh, because of this power of 3 that, that applies to this factor 4 here the negative part is uh, much stronger than the positive part okay so there's a, this is missing so therefore the skewness and ne negative value so this distribution of points would correspond to a negative skewness yeah and the, and it's the other way around for positive skewness. Okay, kurtosis. So the Gaussian has kurtosis zero. Actually, it's a bit suspicious right here. The Gaussian has zero mean, the normalized Gaussian has zero mean, unit variance, and then we have zero third order cumulant, so skewness, and 
zero fourth order cumulant kurtosis and that is actually true for all higher order cumulants so the gaussian only has variance the normalized gaussian only has variance one and every all other cumulants are zero now if the cumulant if the kurtosis is less than zero then um it's more flat distribution and if it's greater than zero it's more a peaky distribution now we could make a similar consideration as before for the skewness to understand why kurtosis is negative for the more flat distribution and positive for the more uh, peaky distribution it gets a bit more complicated um because yeah we have these additional terms so it gets a bit, a bit invol uh, invol involved, and so I'm not going to do this. But you can imagine that, so in this case, it's a similar argument. So in this case, we have more points, sort of, we have heavy tails, as it is called. So we have points far out, but relatively few, few points far out. And most of the points are close to zero, and then we have a few points far out, while here, uh, we have not so many points at zero and a lot of points at a mid-range and then very few points far out. Right? And because of this power of four that we have in the cumulants, these far out points sort of um, dominate and that makes uh, the, cu uh, the cumulants uh, positive for this peaky distribution. Well, maybe it's not entirely convincing, but if you think about it a bit, bit more detail you'll figure it out. Okay. So now, so how do the cumulants now help us uh, with ICA, so with the issue of statistical independence? Now there's a nice property of the cumulants, namely that if you have statistically independent components, then the cross cumulants are zero or more precisely uh, sort of or as a first step we notice that if you have two um, if you can split the random variables into two statistically independent groups then the moments can be written as a product of the lower two lower moments of the groups so um, okay so this is shown here so you consider the third order moment. If you write this out, actually, higher above, I've written these pointy brackets as a sum to calculate the average. Here I write it as an integral. It depends on whether you consider your data as a discrete set of data points or whether you consider it as a continuous distribution over some yeah, the continuous distribution of the data. So here we consider it as a continuous distribution. We have to integrate over yi, yj, uh, yk. So this is the integral. And since we take the average over the product of the three, we have this here, and then we have to multiply here with the probability, the joint probability of yi, yj, yk. Now if these are statistically independent, sorry, if we can split this in two groups, statistically independent groups, yi, yj, on the one hand, and yk, we can rewrite this as this one here, so there's the equality here. So this equals this. We had this, we had this before uh, for just two variables. Then you can pull out, pull apart the, the, uh, integrals and you end up with the average over yi, yj here and the average over yk here. Okay. So now further above we have argued the cumulants. Maybe I go up. to this equation. Yeah. 
So, consider this equation, which is a fourth order equation, uh, because I have zero mean data, so the third order cumulant is a bit boring here. So I argue with the fourth order cumulant. So the fourth order cumulant is the fourth order moment minus all the stuff that you would expect from the lower order moments. Now, if you split this group up, if you can split up this, this group into something that looks like this, then everything that comes from this is subtracted off, right? So nothing remains. So, the cumulant is non-zero only if the fourth order adds something to what you know already from lower orders. Yeah. If what you have on the in the fourth order is already contained in the lower order moments, then it's subtracted off and you have zero. Yeah. And this is what happens here. Since this can be split off, there's nothing in this third order moment that is not cannot already be expected from the lower order moments. Therefore, the cumulant is zero. So here's a more concrete um, calculation for CIIJ, which is YI, YI, YJ. I can split this off if the components are statistically independent. I know I have zero mean data in this case, uh, so this whole thing is zero. For the fourth order cumulant, uh, this is the original definition of the fourth order cumulant. I know because of the statistic statistical independence between yi and yj that I can split this into two parts. Yeah. I can also split these, right? Because yi and yj are statistically independent, I can split them into a yi times a y I, yj. And if this is two times, I have this for this one and for this one. So this is zero because of zero mean constraint, and these two um, cancel out each other, so I also have zero. This is not a proof. This is just an example of this general statement that I've made, that if um, the components are statistically independent, all cross-cumulants vanish. Now, interestingly, the converse is also true, again, without proof. Um, so if all cross-cumulants vanish, then the random variables are statistically independent. Interestingly, pairwise statistical independence does not suffice. Uh, you can imagine um, three variables, A, a random binary variable, B, a random binary variable, and which are statistically independent, and then C, which is A, X, or B. Um, so these would actually, um, so any two of them would be statistically independent, right? Because, um, okay, A and B are statistically independent by definition, yeah? and C is statistically independent of B because it always factors A, in A, which is statistically independent of B. So therefore, if you know C, you can't tell anything about B, because you don't know A, right? So only if you know A and B, you can say something about C. Uh, but if you if you know, only know B, then A is missing, and there's 50-50 chance for C to be on or off. So the three variables are pairwise independent, but if you look at all three of them, then of course you would see the statistical dependence that's expressed in this equation. Um, now, it's not very practical to require that all cross-cumulants vanish in order to make variables statistically independent. I mean, that's the idea now is we calculate cross-cumulants and then we rotate the data such that the cross-cumulants uh, become zero, but you can't do everything, right? So what we, uh, so we go from low order to higher order components. So first order would be mean, so we would subtract the mean in any case, so that doesn't play a role. Then the first relevant component 
would be the second order, that is this one here. Um, we have set that to the identity matrix, so we have made the off diagonal terms of this, um, of this cumulant of the second moment matrix or the covariance matrix to zero by whitening the data, right? So through whitening, we guarantee this. Okay, so the next we could uh, look at the third order cumulants, which is expressed here. So we take all the cross cumulants, so all i, j, k combinations, except for the one where all the three indices are identical. So this is indicated here, i, j, k not equal i, 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 means all cumulants where the three components are not identical, where at least one differs from the others. And we want all of them to be zero, and we do that by squaring the components. That's shown here, right? Squaring the components. So that whenever a cumulant is non-zero, we get a positive contribution in this, um, in this sum, and we want this to be minimal. So we want this to be zero, and then if this sum is zero, we know that all the cross cumulants, third order cross cumulants, are zero. Now, um, if you have symmetric data, then if you have a symmetric distribution, then these are zero in any case, because the positive contributions always cancel out with some negative contributions, right? It's easy to see for in, in one D, but it's also true in higher dimensions. And since many signals are symmetric, like sound, for example, is an inherently symmetric signal. Um, the third order cumulants are often not particularly useful. So, and that's the reason why one often takes the fourth order cumulant, uh, which is the same construct as, as this one, just with, as a fourth order, and we again want to minimize this. Or, if you want to take both into account, you can simply take the sum of these two sums and try to minimize this. So this is the thing, typically, that we want to minimize. We want the complete thing, or one, or this one here, and this is guaranteed by whitening. Okay, so here again, I simply say. Uh, that the unmixing of the original data can be viewed as a rotation. So this is the unmixing of the original data. Can be viewed as a rotation of the whitened data. This hat here indicates whitened data. And the uh, whitening can be done very easily with principal component analysis. That would be then Wx. And then if we multiply the rotation matrix of the whitened data with the whitening matrix, we get our unmixing matrix U.